Welcome back to another episode of the Believe in NFL Draft Prospects podcast. I'm Joe DeLeon, joined by Ryan Roberts, and we have the official list of players that were invited to the 2022 NFL Combine. And as you might imagine, we were a bit disappointed with some snubs for some guys that should have been invited. We're going to dive into that, talking about some of those players that we think should have received that invitation, as well as some of the guys that we're going to be paying attention to or headlines that we're going to, going to be looking forward to at this year's combine. Ryan, how are we doing today on this fine Thursday when we're recording? Good, man. I'm not on my deathbed anymore and I'm 11 pounds <laughs> lighter. So, I'm all good. Um, yeah, I hope nobody gets the uh, bug that's going around at least in my neighborhood. It was uh it was awful for a few days, but I'm alive. So, we're good to go. As someone who's currently trying to cut cuz it's cutting season, I envy the fact that you could say that you just rapidly lost <laughs> 11 pounds. It, it was not the ide- it was not the ideal way to lose 11 pounds. <laughs> it is a method. It is a way to do it. Um, sure. Not dwelling on that too much, Ryan, cuz I'm sure that was traumatizing to to deal sure. with. But um this combine group though. Uh you when we got the list, the first thing you came to me in our Twitter chat, you said like we got to talk about these snubs cuz there's some mm. pretty pretty interesting ones that you brought to my attention and I want to hit on the first one because this is one that I tweeted about. It was one that I talked about on the FCS show and I it, it's really shocking that Aquil Glass from Alabama A&M did not get the invite to the NFL combine. Um in my opinion, I'm shocked that he didn't get it and Cole Kelly did the Southeastern Louisiana quarterback. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's pretty odd to not see Glass's name on this list. Well, not even comparing directly to Cole Kelly, because I mean, Cole Kelly, you know, he was a fine player on the level as well. And he was a guy that made it to the NFL PA bowl. Similarly to glass. It's just that layer of it kind of really stands out to me because it's not a great quarterback class. We've been very vocal with that. So having a guy like a quill glass, who's out of Alabama A&M, who, kind of hits a lot of the thresholds, you know, he's right near six foot four, 226 pounds. He has good hand size and he kind of hits all the the physical thresholds, 37 touchdowns, the six interceptions this past year for Alabama A&M. Obviously he was a really good player for multiple years there, four year starter for Alabama A&M. So highly decorated, highly acclaimed out of the HBCU program was expecting him to get the invite because like I said, he was a, he was at the NFL PA bowl. So he was, you know, considered one of the top senior quarterbacks in the class, at least, you know, relative to what the other games were. So was expecting it. I wanted to see just him there because I think that he's, and I've been talking about him for a couple of years now, Joe, like I think he's a draftable quarterback. I don't think that obviously he's not going to be a guy that's going to be a starting quarterback down the road, but if a quill glass is a guy that just sticks around in the NFL for six, seven years as a back backup, you know, down the line, I'd be like, yeah, I believe it. And he's a guy that might even be a, a dude that you'll look over a little bit and just say like, wow, I didn't know he lasted that long, but he did because he just has so many of the intangible factors that you really like. I, I find it hard to believe why he would not get an invite. I, I'm just more, I don't want to say sad, but I'm disappointed for him because he's a he's a really smart, good young man who had a great career, played in the NFL PA Bowl. Like I, I feel like he deserved that opportunity. Unfortunately, he did not get it. So right, he's somebody who seems to get a, a, a lot of positive attention um, mm-hmm. from a number of different analysts too that are aware of him, and it's it is a bit striking that he doesn't get the invite. And kind of like you're saying, Glass feels like one of those players that we're going to be saying to ourselves, why didn't he get invited to the to the combine in, in maybe right. in a few years from now, he has like career backup, like quality backup for a long period of time written all over him. So, I mean, yep. hoping for the best for glass. I'm, I'm sure that that opportunity might change for him and this isn't going to be his, his final opportunity to prove himself. But one other one though, that this one's really shocking and I didn't even know that he wasn't invited because you look at the list of names and it's, it's easy to overlook some of them and not even think of guys, but Jared Stearns who, was a transfer from Houston Baptist, went to Western Kentucky, uh, was a part of Bailey Zappi's historic season statistically, and he himself put up some really stupid numbers. I believe he led in a number of receiving categories this past year. He also, there were some clips circulating. I think he was at the, was he at the Shrine Bowl this year that he was at? He's at the Shrine game, man. It's Shrine crazy. Bowl. And there was all these clips of him looking really good. I, I don't know how he didn't get the invite over some of these other receivers. Yeah, it, it's really weird from a lot of different layers. 
One, like you said, he was from Houston Baptist with Zappi, came over during the transfer, was a really good player for Houston Baptist, and then he led college football in yeah. receiving this year. We're talking about Cooper Cup. He basically had <laughs> Cooper Cup's numbers on the college level. I mean, he was right uh, right uh, south of 2,000 yards receiving and had 100 and whatever catches he had, and he was a dynamic player for Western Kentucky. So that layer of it alone, like I would have liked to see him just based upon the production that he had, right? And then you said, like, I mean, East West Shrine invite, and then he doesn't get the combine invite. That's not meant not that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> like no. that's, that's that's an anomaly to a degree. And I understand that there's, you know, obviously some people are gonna be like, he's five seven and whatever he is, and 183 pounds. He's a smaller guy for sure. But another stat I saw was he led all of college football this year in yards after catch. So for me seeing what type of athlete that kid is, because obviously he's not a big guy. So if you, the, if the yak ability is going to translate, it's going to have to be somewhat as an athlete or as a route runner. So you want to see him in space. How does he move a little bit? You know, does he have any, any second gear? Is he a guy that short, short shuttle and three cone are off the charts and he's that short area explosive guy. There's got to be a reason for it, but at least you want to see the leading receiver in college football up close and personal and see if it's real or not. It's it honestly, it just doesn't make any sense from, multiple layers even if you think that the production's a little overstated out of western kentucky and maybe he's not quite the NFL prospect that his college production would dictate that's fine but don't we want to see him in person to see that because i thought at the east west like you said there was some i thought he had a good performance i thought he was a tough cover all week he had a good performance there out in las vegas i'm very surprised this is probably number one on the list where i was like wow that's really odd that he did not get an invite because i felt like just the resume on top of one another I felt like it dictated at least him to get an invitation to at least test himself and show what type of athlete he is. Yeah, and it's not like we're talking about a guy coming from like a Presbyterian small FCS that had stupid statistical numbers and isn't a very good athlete. Like this is a good football right. player. And again, probably going to be a guy that sticks on a roster and does some really good things for a, a team that needs a, an ancillary receiver like him. I, I He's probably going to end up slipping through the cracks because of it. And he's and he comes from a football family too. I know, like, right. well, I don't harp on that too much, but his his it was actually his younger brother, Caton Stearns, was drafted last year by the Minnesota Vikings, I believe. Yeah. Right. So, like, he also has like the lineage part of the conversation too. So, like, there's just a lot of layers. I'm like, why is this guy not getting at least just a look? Like, I'm not saying like, oh, definite draftable type of player, but he's not going to be able to go to the combine when you're the leading receiver in college football. Your old, your young, your brother just got drafted in the NFL last year. You're an East West shrine invite, And you just went from Houston Baptist where you were a really productive player and then transferred up to the FBS level. And we're still incredibly productive. I'm just, there's just something that's just missing the mark on that one. Ironically, we have a, another transfer from an FCS program from Montana to Nebraska, Samori Torre, Another guy that's wide receiver. He also does not get the invite, and he was clearly this past year the best receiver on that Nebraska football team. Um, I believe he went also to a, one of the bigger bowl games that he participated in for the the All Star events. I forget which one it was off the top of my head. I'm going to look in a second if if you don't know Ryan, but he is also a very odd one because we we know that he's a good athlete and he he would fit seemingly on on a lot of teams' rosters. Yeah, yeah, I can't remember if it was East West or NFL PA, but I think he was definitely on one of the top, one of the second or third top, you know, games of, of the uh, cycle. Two Ray is a weird one, man, because he do he's the same way, man. Like he dominated Montana, and yeah, it was the, at, at it was Montana, the game. It, was it was at Shrine. Okay, so he was at Shrine, and he so he dominated the University of Montana when they had a, another good wide receiver named Sa Sa uh, Samuel Ackham, who's a, who's a, in the draft as well, and he was. The best receiver on that team was one of the best receivers in college football a couple years ago on the FCS level. He transfers up to Nebraska after everything that's going on. And people are, you know, obviously with COVID shutdowns and all that type of stuff, he takes an opportunity to go to Nebraska. And he's the best receiver on Nebraska. And unlike Jared Stearns, he's a six foot plus receiver. Like he's not a small guy, right? Like he has a little bit of length to him. He's a guy that transferred up. Had a really good showing, um, obviously, this year at Nebraska. Was an East-West Shrine invite. Just very confused on why he didn't get his opportunity because I feel like, again, a guy that's proven everywhere he's been so far that he is a caliber of athlete to dictate that opportunity. And, unfortunately, he's another guy that will not be in Indianapolis soon. Yeah, shame to see another one of those guys who is able to create a, a bigger 
um, impression of him going to a bigger program, still not getting that recognition in the invite to the NFL Combine. Brock Hoffman, we know who has a very interesting story coming from Coastal yeah. Carolina, ends up going to Virginia Tech, um, has all this time to now prove himself after having to sit out the year like we all recall happening to him. But he, yet another player here not getting the invite, uh, seems a bit odd that Hoffman with that name recognition is not a part of this group. Another East West Shrine guy. They could not get the invite. I just there must be a I, lot of hate for the Shrine gamers. Man, <laughs> they hate Eric Alco out here apparently. Yeah, but a separate, uh, he, separate issue. <laughs> yeah. um, well, no, it's it is weird though, man. Not only is it the third straight East West Shrine invite, but also all. Th- well, actually, I'm sorry. We talked about a Quill Glass to start. So Stearns, to Ray, and now Brock Hoffman. All three of those guys were on FCS programs and transferred up because Coastal Carolina was an FCS program still at the time when Hoffman transferred over to Virginia Tech. So a couple comparisons there. Hoffman has been a, a starting center now for the last couple years for Virginia Tech. He's a big physical dude, 6'3", 300-plus plus pounds. Finisher is the word that you describe for Brock Hoffman. He actually played, I believe, guard when he was at Coastal, maybe even some tackle if I remember correctly. So he was definitely not a center, though. When he was at Coastal Carolina, he transfers over to Virginia Tech. He eventually finds his his spot inside. So a guy that's played multiple positions on the college level, and he was a good center for Virginia Tech, man. Good, solid film, finisher, thresholds, you know, solid enough in, in all areas. Not a flashy athlete, but I figure in this class where Tyler Linderbaum and then a huge drop-off to, like, Cam Jurgens, Alex Lin- Alec Lindstrom's, like Donovan West's, Nick Ford's. Like, there's not a lot of really good center depth in this class. I'm actually shocked that he is not invited because I just think that just by default, he's going to be one of these high floor type of centers in this class because honestly, there just isn't that many names in this class. And Hoffman, for me, has been a consistent good center in an ACC team for the for an ACC team. Excuse me in Virginia Tech over the last couple of years. It's just a very odd situation that he did not get his invite because I feel like the center class just would dictate him at least getting an opportunity. That lack of good centers in this draft makes this all the more odd that he's he's not amongst this group. The, the last one that you picked is <laughs> really perplexing to me that Reed Blankenship, the defensive back from Middle Tennessee, is not amongst the people invited because it feels like we've been talking about Blankenship for three, Forever. four years now, and we've been hyping him up, and, and a lot of people have been discussing how he's this gem and he's a quality player. He might not be some elite prospect, but he's still a um, big name recognition guy, and he doesn't receive the nod despite that. Yeah, they had another safety a few years ago, Javante Moffitt, who was a good player, and I think he lasted on the Browns for a couple years. And I remember when Moffitt was a senior, Blankenship was a junior, and Blankenship just tore it up um, with Moffitt, and he um, he had a dynamic season because I think Moffitt got hurt after the first few games, and he kind of became the leader in the clubhouse for Middle Tennessee at safety. And now for three years, he's been draft eligible because he was actually a senior last year, took the COVID year. I think he's a sixth-year kid, if I remember correctly, and he's literally been draft eligible for multiple years, and he's been a guy that I feel like we've been talking about since the 2020 cycle, of potentially being a part of it. And there were some people that have been big fans of him, man. Like, not even from a true free safety type where they could play some center field and play deep zones. But some people I, I talked to before said, like, oh, some teams might like him with his length and athleticism as a press corner at the next level. Like, he might be able to even play a little bit outside. So there's been fans. And I know he's dealt with some injuries. But, like, I, I don't really understand this one. Because, like, you hear, you hear some reports on the back end about, like, some – character stuff and whatever but like I, I none of that stuff has ever been proven so it's pure speculation so just a guy that's been on you know on the mind for a while kind of wild because I mean if you would have told me last year that he you know that he wouldn't be invited to a combine I would have called you crazy because I I was a I was under the impression that going into last cycle this kid could be a mid-round pick and now just a year later we're sitting here and he doesn't even have a combine invite which is pretty Pretty crazy to think about how things change so quickly. Yeah, and it's not like he had some crazy drop off in performance. Like this is a guy that we've recognized and we've talked about for again, what feels like for four years at this point. But uh, it's super weird not seeing Reed Blankenship amongst that amongst that group. Yeah. Ryan, hitting into 
some of the headlines and some of the things that we're going to be looking forward to at the combine. I, I'm kind of got a giggle reading through the notes and what you put down. Um, yeah. That the first thing you're looking for is Aiden Hutchinson's mythical three cone. So there's uh, <laughs> this speculation that it's where that number is going to be. So what we care to elaborate on, uh, on what exactly that, that conspiracy is. I love to, man. I love to. Uh, so first and foremost, draft Twitter always goes absolutely ape shit. Can I say ape shit on here? They go ape shit, man. Go for it. For okay, I'm gonna say ape shit one more time because it's fun to say. They go <laughs> ape shit every single year when Bruce Feldman puts out his freaks list. And I love Feldman's freak list over the athletic. Like it's one of my favorite pieces every single year. Usually I think it's like a top 50. And I think he did like a hundred players last year. Um just diving into like some of their testing numbers and weight room numbers. It's it's an awesome piece, man. But some people like really fall for this stuff sometimes and sometimes i'm just like eh, those numbers i don't know about that one man like i'm not sure and we saw i think aiden hutchinson was number one on feldman's freak list last year and he had like some of the testing numbers i completely believe it was like the 40 times and if you watch aiden hutchinson's like he is incredibly explosive linear player so i'm like he's gonna run a fast 40 i'm sure he's gonna jump a good vertical j- broad jump like all that stuff i'm like cool on film though and I don't know. I guess this is a hot take still. I don't think he's the most flexible guy of all time. Like, I don't think he's got great bend in his ankle. And I don't think he changes direction all that great. So when I saw this three cone that Bruce Feldman put on the list, I remember it was six, five, seven, I believe, a three cone, which that's like a defensive back number, man. Like that, yeah. that's a wide receiver number. That's a silly, silly number for a defensive end. I, I saw Kentley Platt, who does the RAS stuff, the relative athletic score, which I know we're going to do some stuff with down the stretch here. He posted just like a mock of like if those numbers were true. And that would be the fastest three cone ever by a defensive end in history of recorded stats for the for the testing. And I can't believe that. I can't fathom it because one, I mean, it's an outlier, right? Because that's the only time that's ever going to happen. But also two, I don't think that matches the film. Like I don't, I don't see Aiden Hutchinson being this historic tester in the three cones. I still, I see some, some tightness in his ankles and his hips. So I want to see the mythical three cone because I just want to see if it's actually true, because I have some hesitation and I have some reservations that that number's a little fixed at the, uh, at the Michigan athletic building. So to peel back the the curtain a little bit um, for those who might be new to the show, I was a, college long snapper at the division one level. And th- so at that number you're referring to that came F- from his FCS ju- level, FCS, man. F- FCS, FCS. Okay. Not, Thanks not, for yeah. clarifying no, Th- that, kidding. that three cone drill was, uh, was from his, his junior testing, correct? I don't even know if it was junior testing. It was from the Michigan uh, right. off season testing. So I don't even know if right. it was junior day. So yeah. to, to, to peel back the, this, if it was that to peel back where this is coming from. So when you're going into your, when you're in the off season programming and you're doing your, your, your strength training, your, your conditioning and all that stuff before spring ball at the very end of it, all of these schools will do athletic testing because they want to see what progress you've made, all of that stuff. Now there are instances where, where you do have scouts come in on a separate occasion to get that information, but more often than not, those numbers that they're collecting, they're not actually doing the testing. They're getting it from the school. So uh, a funny story from when I was, I think it was when I was a sophomore, we had a running back named Harold Cooper. And uh, do you, I don't know if you, if that name rings a bell with you, Ryan, at all, but there was possible speculation that he might make it to the next level and, and stuff like that. So the, when we were testing our 40s, you know, everybody ran one. And it, for most people, the coaches didn't really care. But for Coop, they kept retesting him until they got him at a 4.38. Like a couple of the times they tested him at was like a, like a 4.6. Uh, like a four five. And then suddenly there was one that was like a a sub four, four. So my point here is I don't know how reliable that information is. So I it's pot. I'm not trying to discredit them or anything. It's possible that maybe he comes close to it, which would be insane. It doesn't really show that on tape, but more often than not, those numbers are usually not that accurate. Right. So uh, just a little hesitation on taking that as the gospel. Cause I, cause there were a lot of numbers in that piece especially for Hutchinson's side of things where I'm like, okay, I could see that. But like, man, I like, I just don't understand that. I don't think that people yeah. truly understand what like How a six, five, seven, 
looks like. That's at, especially when Hutchins is going to be like 265 pounds. Like it doesn't make any sense. So let's we'll just see about that one. We'll yeah. see. And when it if it does happen, and I'm kind of hoping it does because they'd be bonkers to sit and be able to say that it actually did happen, but. Yeah. We'll have to see. Speaking of bonkers, though, Leo Chanel, the Wisconsin linebacker, man, Ryan, I, this is, was a home run pick here for who we have to be watching for, just the man in general. I saw a a clip that somebody reshared from an old bench press? tweet. Yeah, the bench press. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, had, yeah. he hit like 40-something on 225, yeah. which is – this, am I correct in saying that Larry Allen hit 43 and he was supposed to be considered this this crazy, strong offensive lineman? Wasn't it Some, 43? I think he might have done even more than that, but I don't know if they kept it official back then. But okay. I think the record is 49, if I remember correctly. So either way, but 49 was by like a short arm defensive tackle or offensive yeah. lineman. So not yeah, a linebacker. <laughs> not a linebacker. I mean, I mean, Leo Chanel is almost as big as an offensive lineman. He's 260 pounds, but it's. So he's another guy that was on Feldman's freak list to backtrack for a second, right? Mm -hmm. So he, at 260 plus pounds, 6'2", 261 listed, he reportedly ran a four-second flats, I believe it was, 20-yard shuttle, which is like blazing, dude. Nuts. Like that's that's almost a defensive back time. Yeah. Like that's, that's crazy. And he's another guy on film that's linear explosive. Like you could sell me on him running 4'6 something at 260 pounds, which is pretty nuts too. But then – the bench press, like you said, this thing. So I talked to him what we had him on the show on, on the podcast. And I remember, I, I think I don't even think I talked to him about it on the podcast. I talked to him beforehand, but cause I had seen that thing floated out there before. So that was when he was like a freshman in college. Yeah. Right. And like he did 40 <laughs> reps and he's like, yeah, I don't really like max out like that anymore. He's like, but you know, I could, I could put 40 plus pretty much anytime I want type of thing. I'm like, Jesus, dude, That's like this guy's disgusting. <laughs> he's going to set a record at the combine. I think at the, at the 225 mark. And it's going to be like, cause the kid, I mean, if you look at him, dude, he is, he, he doesn't skip, he doesn't skip a workout. Like he's, he's that type of dude. So <laughs> he's going to test phenomenally. And I think that some people are going to start to, they're going to start to question maybe their ideal ideology on him a little bit. I think some people have kind of just slapped him with a, he's a big run stopping middle linebacker that doesn't move really well, but then they're going to be like, Oh wait, Oh, he, he can move a little better than we anticipated. And he can do 40 plus on the bench press. <laughs> so he's a, uh, he's a freak, man. He's a freak. Do you think that he's going to come in at that two sixty number? Or I, I feel like they're probably going to try and get him lower. So he runs a faster 40 time. I'd say he run. I say he comes in like two fifty two, two fifty three. Like I, I doubt he's two sixty because it's impressive to see the athletic stuff that he can do at two sixty. But there's no reason as a true off ball linebacker yeah. to be two hundred sixty pounds. Like you don't, big. you don't know to be, and it's not a bad two sixty. Like he's just a giant, like hulking dude. But like, no reason to be that way. Like you, right. two fifty, two fifty five, you're good to go. I'm sure he's got a little body fat that they can his his combine prep can try to shred off a little bit. Uh, last thing that you wanted to hit on here, Ryan, was the athletic testing separation between this this cornerback group. And I, I thought this was intriguing. I'm curious to see what direction you take this in. But it seems like we have a lot of different body types and frames in this corner group. And there's some really talented players, you know, from Derek Stingley to Sauce Gardner. And none of them are built similarly so what was your thought on um how different in the numbers that we could get here with these guys well the assumed top three from everybody i've heard right now is that it is Derek stingley jr lsu sauce gardner from cincinnati ahmad sauce gardner andrew booth jr from clemson now i am an andrew booth jr cornerback one guy but i think that the conversation up top is going to be can he, any of these guys separate themselves as athletes? Because we're all we're all three of those guys are going to be six foot plus. They're going to have long arms, thirty two plus inch arms, and they. I and so I think that the separator is going to be one. People think Stingley is going to run fast. Like they think State Derek Stingley is like four three zero fast, right? So like if he separates himself that way, that's awesome. But I also think that Andrew Boone Jr. has the chance to run four three high and jump you know, very high in the vert, very good in the broad. So I, I want to see who separates himself and who falls off a little bit. Cause I think that this could be a, a thing where 
Maybe Sauce Gardner doesn't test quite as well as maybe people think. Well, if he's a four five zero guy, are you okay with that? If he's a four four seven comparative to, to um, comparative to Derek Stingley running four three two, are you scared off a little bit from the people that want to call him cornerback one? Then you move into guys like Roger McCreary from Auburn. We already know he's got short arms. What is he going to run? I think there's a lot of cornerbacks in this class that are going to separate themselves at the combine because I think right now there's not a ton of separation between a lot of these guys. Is Trent McDuffie that next guy off the board comparative to a Roger McCreary or a Darian Kendrick or a Martin Emerson or a Kyler Gordon? Like, What does the pecking order mean in, or what does the pecking order look like in this class? And I think testing is going to be a lot because I think there's a lot of guys that are kind of clumped together. So I'm interested in seeing how, how they test because I think it's really going to separate this class a little bit. Yeah, tons of really, really talented corners in this class. And I think that that testing is probably going to be really important for helping some of these guys maybe push into the first round as as we always see corners. The ones that are the freakish athletes are the ones that the teams fall in love with. All right, Ryan, I think that's going to be it from us on today's show. Thank you for tuning in, folks. We're going to be coming at you with more Combine conversations. And we're actually like really freaking close to the Combine, so we're going to go full guns blazing when that does happen but uh be sure to hit subscribe on the youtube channel or your audio feed so so you're up to date and we will talk to you soon